species, of course, are important for various different ecosystem services. So it makes sense if we've got fewer species, because we know rates of species loss are increasing, slower rates of ecosystem functioning, and therefore we may have fewer ecosystem services. This is by no means a, a new idea. Darwin spoke about growing crops together to en enhance yield, except it doesn't always happen like that. Modern agriculture does the exact opposite. This is because it depends on which function you're looking at and which groups of species. And obviously, as, well, maybe it's not obvious, as community ecologists, we tend to be interested in more than one function at a time and multifunctionality and indeed multi-stability, which is something that we've looked at more recently. So for the past, well, I guess in the mid to late 90s with renewed vigor, people started to characterize this relationship between biodiversity or species loss and ecosystem functioning. And theoretically, it would be very nice if there was a strong direct um, relationship between the two of them. But it doesn't always seem to be the case, especially when you try and test this empirically. If you've got redundant species in your system, you're more likely to have this shape of a curve. Um, if you have a sort of less species-rich system, you're more likely to have a keystone species, which would result in the opposite sort of shape curve. Or my favourite one, which is not really a relationship at all, but we can call it the idiosyncratic relationship, which really means it depends on which particular species, which particular function, and tends to be what you, happen when you, what you get when you go out into the real world to do some empirical tests. That's not to say we should give up trying to characterise it, but it just means we need to really up make our models an awful lot more predictive. Well, to make them more predictive, we need much more specific information based on the system that we're working in. And that's pretty much um, what everybody in my lab does in some shape or form. So what we're looking at is do the effects of species loss vary with environmental context? So this has been done various different ways, using some of the classic grassland experiments, using like microcosm approaches, sometimes we use food web approaches, or getting out into the field and doing actual removal exercises. So what we want to do primarily is try and characterize, see what happens when species are lost from a system, but then see how that changes under different environmental contexts. So in our lab, we, we try and look, look for differences and see if we can predict how the changing environmental context may change these species interactions based on difference between habit ecosystem types, habitat types. Does it vary depending on different levels of ecological complexity? Can we scale up from these small experiments to large ecosystem-based answers, solutions to applied problems um, under different disturbance regimes, under different abiotic and biotic stressors? The last point there is, is quite important because we're trying to always, of course, frame this in the context of, of global change. And I tend to work in coastal systems and we've obviously, just like every other ecosystem, it's being heavily impacted by multiple anthropogenic stressors. And um, we consider this very crude illustration of biodiversity. Anthropogenic pressures tend to lead to tend to lead to a loss of diversity or a loss of species. But sometimes there can be species range shifts as well. Sometimes in local levels, you can actually have, due to the addition of invasive species, if you're looking at species richness per se, you can actually have an increase. So rather than just look at species loss, we're looking at changes in great in in diversity regimes. We've got some examples from rocky shores. Where these top shells are now actually used to be limited to western shores. Now they're um, encroaching, moving around the east coast of Britain. We have northern limpet species, which are retreating. And we have a new warm water species, which has arrived sort of up to mid Wales and around the, the southwest of England. So species range shifts, species loss, they need to be sort of considered at, at, at the same time. And this is probably due to climate change. Um, I guess we're safe to assume that here within these walls. When we go outside, you might need to defend that a bit more, but I would be pretty confident to say climate change is behind an awful lot of species range shifts and species loss. And in coastal ecosystems, this comes in a sort of a two-pronged attack. We've got the ocean warming, but we've also got increased storminess. So other parts of the world may have issues with drought and various other implications of climate change. Around the Irish Sea, things are going to get wetter, windier, and milder. Yay, OK. OK, so this is just to introduce you to the model system that our experiments are based in, for people who aren't uh, coastal ecologists. Primary producers are macroalgae and microalgae. These are consumed directly by this suite of grazers, limpets, littorinids, winkles, um, purple striped shells. But we can't just use a food web approach because these sort of basal resources also compete directly for space in the benthic system with the filter feeders like mussels and um, barnacles. These are all preyed upon by species like crabs and predators. So that's a very simple system. We do a lot of work trying to characterize the interactions between these, then applying stresses and trying to see how, what would happen if we lost any of these links in the system, and can we predict that based on what the changes that we expect to happen, things getting warmer, stormier, um, pollution, all the sort of um, anthropogenic stressors. So 
I had done some work previously looking at um, how wave action determines the dynamics on rocky shores. It's sort of a crude proxy for if we understand how things happen in sheltered conditions and how that differs in an exposed condition and everything is getting stormier, maybe we can predict the effects of loss of species based on what we know already. So a PhD student, Rob Maravisky, did an experiment, a simple experiment, or so we thought, um, just looking at um, on exposed and sheltered shores, looking at trying to uncover the links between macroalgae, the grazers, they can compete depending on different conditions. These can be a good or a bad thing. They can provide shelter, or if they grow too fast, different life stages, they can crowd each other out. And how the, the links between um, grazers, barnacles, how they all interact with each other to determine the amount of primary production that's accumulating on the shore. We expected to find a predictable pattern based on what we knew already about exposed and rocky shores. Um, unfortunately, we didn't find that at all. We found far greater intersite variability than anything that we could predict. And these are extreme ends of very exposed, very sheltered, but just very different things were happening. So that sort of sent us back to the drawing board a little bit. And we decided we needed to come up with a system where we could look at the sort of grazer interactions and be able to manipulate storminess and any sort of a proxy for that. And we were also interested in looking at the effects of warming as well. So we built these outdoor mesocosms. Inside each of these tables, this is at our lab in uh, Portaferry at Queen's University, um, Belfast. So each of these tanks is 45 litres, and we can independently control the temperature in them, create sort of mini rock pools, put all the species we're interested in in them, some of them have got water splashing on top to be storminess or high wave action. Some of them just have water seeping in from the bottom. So this is how we were interested in um, sort of teasing out any diversity effects. So Rob and I designed this experiment where we had wave action, basically the dump buckets turned on or off, two different temperatures, elevated plus two degrees and ambient, and various grazer diversity treatments. So we had no grazers present, each one by itself, and then all three present. Now, we kind of had an inkling there was going to be some grazer diversity effect. What we were interested in is seeing whether it changed under the different sets of conditions when things got warmer or if things got stormier. So what we found, uh, we measured loads of things in all these experiments, but I'm just going to look at macroalgal biomass accumulation, so that's the same response on all of the figures, just for sort of concision. So we didn't find any effect of warming on any of our interactions, which was interesting, unexpected, but interesting. We also couldn't tease out any differences amongst the treatments, this was all a bit of a mess, very variable responses in the no wave action treatments. But in the treatments or the tanks or the mesocosms that had enhanced wave action, all of a sudden we were seeing these stronger diversity effects, which was something that we were used to seeing in the field. Okay, better hurry up. But remember this was all done in a mesocosm, which is very flat bottom, not completely, not terribly accurate for what's going on in the real world. So we went back out, tried to look at um, what would happen in different habitats, playing with the same sort of grazer species, back out into the field, use the rocky shore where these all kind of, you can find them in various different microhabitats, in rock pools, mussel beds, you find them everywhere, but in rock pools you get much more diverse algal assemblages compared to on the bare rock, whereas in mussel beds sort of a halfway, halfway situation. So Rob went back out, did a series of removals of each of them, so we had a, a gradient of diversity, each one by itself, two species, all three species, in the different, uh, different habitats. What he found, initially we thought we were seeing some difference based on the habitat they were in, but after about a year these all emptied out and we've got quite a strong idiosyncratic or diversity effect on algal cover, richness, evenness, assemblage structure. This species here, the common limpet patella, had a really strong role, so it didn't matter which, um, which environment it was in. So that was, that was interesting, but warming and species loss is really only one of the multiple anthropogenic stresses that we know is happening, coastal system being bombarded, um, biological invasions, pollution, these are all happening at the same time. We know that these things can impact rates of functioning, which can have reciprocal relationships between driving diversity or not. These are important because they underpin happiness, happy students. Um, so student number two, Siobhan Vai, was interested in asking this question, does the presence of invasive species alter community responses to other stressors? So she was trying to put it all together. And so we did this in rock pools, and we created rock pools. We did stuff out in the field. These are using the mesocosms. We sort of created, based on the relative abundance of what's actually out in the shore a few metres away, only in half of all of these, she included a, an invasive, common invasive species, Sargassum muticum. And the other half, we had one that looks a bit like it, morphologically similar, because we didn't want to have something completely different. We just wanted to test for the presence of the invasive species. And in this... Um, she wanted had three temperature treatments and three nutrient treatments. So she wanted to see how the system was, was with the presence of an invasive, how that um, affected their ability to respond to other stressors. 
And what Siobhan found was, this actually, this looks like something was starting to happen, but it's actually not significant. In invaded assemblages, we didn't have any effects of temperature, but in our non-invaded, we did have an interactive effect. When we turned the temperature up a little bit, it didn't make that much of a difference, but when we turned the temperature up to sort of plus four degrees above ambient, <laughs> all of a sudden we had a crash in biomass accumulation, which is quite interesting and tied in with some of our, um, some of our climate change models. So when we look at the effects of nutrients, again, the invaded systems didn't have any, didn't, didn't seem to be um, quite resistant to the other stressors, the nutrients and the warming that we were um, applying. And we had another interactive effect, this time it was very dose dependent, on the non-invaded systems. So in our native rock pools, biomass accumulation dropped quite a lot when we added a bit of nutrients, but in our high nutrient treatment, which was, would have been to mimic so quite a, a nutrient enriched um, environment, it appears to recover, but remember this is just looking at total biomass accumulation. In fact, these are different algal species. This is when all the ephemeral algae took over. So you could argue there was some sort of redundancy built into the system, but it was very species specific and it would really very much depend on which function that you're interested in. So Siobhan also did some experiments out in the field. We haven't been successful at manipulating ocean warming in the field yet, but we are working on it. Um, but she did manage to do some removals of the invasive and some nutrient additions. And uh, this time when we did it in the field, it was an awful lot more complicated. The invaded pools did have lower species richness, lower macro and microalgal biomass, but there were very complex interactions um, among the different algal groups and nutrient intensity wasn't important. So we did get different results when we did it in the field as to when we did it in the mesocosm, which was not entirely unexpected because when you go out, this was done on the west coast of Ireland, Atlantic coasts, probably not nutrient limiting, so adding an awful lot of nutrients didn't actually um, change any of the, the key interactions. So to conclude, um, I think we've shown that the effects of species loss are context dependent. We could have said that before doing all of these experiments, any ecologist will know that, but we've tried to define the exact context in a specific species interaction, and I think that's the information that we need to make more predictive models about the effects of species loss to make them more accurate. Um, we've also shown that diversity loss can can alter the impacts of stressors. So to evaluate the consequences of diversity change, we need to determine which contexts are important for which species and which levels of functioning. And we do this by integrating multiple experimental approaches to get at the mechanisms and highly controlled experiments, then going out into the field to introduce more levels of ecological complexity and more kind of realism into the system. So I think that I'll just thank all of the people who've helped and participated in all these experiments <coughs> and finish up by um, inviting everybody to our aquatic group meeting in September in Charles Darwin House and also to come to our mixer this evening in the Baltic Fleet at seven. That's it. No, that's something we're actually working on at the moment. We haven't done that yet, but it's, it would be really interesting to do. That is something we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you. Automatic. Emily is next. Okay. I thought I were better than that. Perfectly fine to hear. Okay. Our next speaker, Emily Simmons. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about the role of changing reproductive synchrony in the population dynamics of wild great tits. 
So just a bit of background to start with in case any of you don't spend quite as long thinking about this as I do. Um, phonology is the timing of life history events. Um, and this can be very interesting and important because um, in seasonal environments, such as what we have here, there are only very short windows of optimal conditions in which um, species can complete energetically demanding life history events, such as breeding, migrating, or molting. Um, so just as an example of how short these windows can be, um, this is a photo from um, my field site in one week, and then the week after, it looked like this. So during spring, we have quite rapid change, and these shifts can also happen interannually. So the timing of peak resources doesn't happen at the same time each year. These two photos could equally have been two consecutive years on the same date in the same area. And so species are having to predict in any given year when the... Um, highest rate of resources will be available, and so when they should time their life history. And for species higher up in higher trophic levels, this is even more challenging because they're not matching just to a climate window, they're matching to another species that they use as a resource. Um, so I look at this in Whiteham Woods in the UK, so it's a woodland just outside Oxford, working on um, a winter moth, caterpillar, great tit, and oak tree system. Um, and this is a great system to work on, especially if you're looking in climate change, because we've got more than 60 years worth of both climate and population data. Um, and so even the system matching is also very important across many levels. So the caterpillars want to time their hatching to match the bud burst of oak trees that they feed on, and the great tits want to time their breeding to match the peak abundance of caterpillars to feed their chicks. Um, and for this particular work, I focus mostly just on this section of the woodland. Um, and this is one of the longest running parts of the woodland with quite high density of nest boxes and mostly on the caterpillar great tit interaction. So matching for the great tits and the caterpillars. So as I've already said, the great tits want to time their breeding and the peak demand of chick rearing, which is when chicks are about seven days old, to match with the highest abundance of late instar larvae of the caterpillars. But this is quite challenging for the great tits because their initiation of reproduction, they're laying the first egg actually occurs 30 days roughly before the peak demand, and this is in advance of when the caterpillars hatch. So they can't use a cue of the abundance of caterpillars to decide when to breed. They need to use environmental proxies in order to predict in any given year when the peak abundance of caterpillars is going to occur. And now because this is so environmentally dependent, we usually assume that the cue is spring temperature, and this helps with sort of the interannual variations, but it can also be disrupted by directional climate change, which we've now sort of got occurring. Um, and it's bringing up questions of how these species will respond. Will they both respond in the same way? How will this directional change add to the interannual variation we're also seeing? Um, and will the synchrony remain under these new conditions? So the research questions I have for this is how will the directional climate change impact phenology? In this case, I'm looking at hatch date. Um, which processes are driving any phenotypic change? So if we do see an advance or change in hatch date, is this driven by genetic change or phenotypic plasticity that we're seeing um, for the interannual variations? Um, and will great tits remain synchronized under these new conditions to the food resource? Um, and how will any of these changes impact population dynamics. So to look at all of these things, I can't exactly go in and heat up the whole of Whiteham Woods. Um, it's not very ethical or logistically possible, so you need to use mathematical modeling. And in this case, I'm using an integral projection model. I'm just gonna give a very brief summary of how this works. So no scary equations for anyone that's worrying about that. Um, this is made up of four fundamental functions that characterize some key processes in population dynamics and in trait changes. So we can track both the population and the traits using this kind of models. These are based on linear models um, that are parameterized based on the data that I have from White and Woods in all those years. So they characterize survival, development, so survival of individuals from one year to the next, and the development of their traits, so the trait changes from year to year based on the environment. They also characterize the recruitment of new individuals and their traits that they inherit. Um, and so all of these processes um, have some element of environmental variables included in that as well when I've been creating the models so we can work out the um, environmental influence on each of these and simulate forwards. So I create simulations um, 
and basically it goes for one year as each time step forwards, and at each point I choose um, environmental variables to influence these functions, so things like the beach mast, which is the winter food source of the great tits, spring temperature, winter temperature, and these values are randomly chosen um, based on a distribution um, from, with specified means and variances at each time step. Um, so these are quite commonly, well, relatively commonly used models, but this one differs from previous ones that have been used basically because of the inheritance function. So in this instance, um, the inheritance function is usually being created um, based on data and just fitting linear models to the data. But here we're also basing it on mechanistic understanding and quantitative genetics, um, which means that we can have a genetic component as well as an environmental component of the phenotype that's inherited and the genetic components sort of independent of the environment. And then we can track both of these through time and see which um, components, which processes are really driving the phenotypic change that we see. Um, I'm also including um, a prediction of the winter moth caterpillar peak date um, at each time step in this model, also based on the environmental variables that I'm selecting. So that's also predicted at each time step so we can see how the timing of the caterpillar shifts um, with the environmental scenarios that I'm testing. Um, so I ran simulation models for 500 years and I started off by just running it based on the current environment. So if the current environment continued, what would we see? So this is just an example of the population size. It's a female only model, so it's female population size going across 500 years. Um, and the coloration is gonna continue throughout the presentation. So the dark line is the mean of 100 stochastic runs. The gray mess is sort of all of the runs and the white line is an illustration of what one of these stochastic environmental runs looks like. So we can see that the population size is remaining relatively steady under this scenario, but we also are interested in what the phenotype looks like. So this is the hatch date, and we can see that it's getting slightly steadily earlier across our model run. Um, and this would be in line with what we would expect because there's been shown to be a selection for earlier hatch date already in the population under current conditions. Um, and just to say the population size is also at the level we would expect for this area of the woodland. So it seems to be capturing the dynamics nicely. Um, but we can also um, <coughs> sort of digest this um, phenotypic change into two different components. So we've got the environmental component as the red line here and the genetic component in blue and then the resulting phenotype in black. So these don't quite sum because they are based on scaled variables but are plotted on this to make it a bit more intuitive. Um, and we can see that the current change is being driven mainly by the genetic component, but there's also an environmental fluctuation on top. So just to summarize quickly, this model seems to capture the population dynamics of our population well. There's a trend towards earlier laying driven by genetic change, but with a little bit of phenotype plasticity. But we really want to test novel scenarios here. So I've been testing what happens to the population if we increase the spring temperature. So instead of just having a distribution continuing, the mean of the distribution I'm selecting mean temperature from, as you can see on this graph, increases as the model run goes on. So in this case, we can see that while the dynamics of the population size is quite similar, it's at a much lower level with an increasing mean spring temperature. Before it was around sort of 50 individuals, we're now looking at more like 25 females. Um, and we can also see a much stronger change in the mean phenology. Um, so the hatch date now is increasing continually and at a much higher rate across this model run. It's getting earlier um, through the 500 years. And this is being driven um, partly by the genotype, the blue line, but as you can see, the phenotype is increasing at a much higher rate, and this is driven by the environmental change. So we're seeing some plasticity as well as genetic change in this scenario. Um, so just to summarize from this, there's a lower population size with maybe slower fluctuations under the increasing mean temperature. And the mean phenotype gets steadily earlier and it's driven by plasticity and genetic change. So this is all very good, but this isn't the only scenario that's predicted for these kind of populations. And I think a key question is, what happens if the great tits and the caterpillars respond differently? So in the previous model, Spring the spring temperature selected is used for both to predict the caterpillars and the great tits. What I really want to get at for these um, interspecific interactions is what happens if the great tit phenology 
changes differently to the blue tits. So what if we increase the spring temperature that the caterpillars experience, but the great tits are not experiencing um, a change? So either the great tits aren't responding, or it could be that the temperatures that the caterpillars are using are changing at a faster rate than those that the great tits use. So under this scenario, you see quite a different change in the population dynamics. So there's an initial decrease, increase in the population size across the model run. There's also a lot more variability. It then starts to decrease towards the end of the 500 years. Um, and we can see, again, with the um, phenotype, although the great tits are experiencing no environmental change um, themselves, there's still an advance in the mean phenotype across the model run. Um, and you can see this compared to the caterpillar date that's now in green. So the caterpillar peak is shifting at a faster rate. And I think this can start to explain some of the, the sort of humped trend we get in population size. So as the two, the hatch date and the caterpillar peak get closer together, they're getting more synchronous. It's about the right time that the great tits want the caterpillars to be around for their chicks. And the population size is increasing. But as you go further along the model, the great tits are not responding at the same rate, so the caterpillars are getting to a point where they're almost passing the great tits, and the, and the peak is almost occurring prior to hatching. And this is where the population starts to decline. And you can see in this case that the phenotypic change is driven entirely by genetic change. There's no plasticity going on in this scenario because there's no environmental change. So to summarize population size under this sort of decoupled scenario, has an initial increase, then decline, it's driven by caterpillar peak advancing faster than hatch date. Um, and despite no environmental change, we do still see a phenotypic advance. Um, and it's, yeah, wholly driven by genetic change. So this is an overall summary of all these different scenarios. I think it showed this a, fl a flexible modeling framework where we can tease apart contributions of genetic change and phenotypic plasticity into the population um, and phenotype changes that we see in this population. Also, more biologically, it shows that um, the whitened population seems relatively robust to change. Although there are changes in the population size, it hasn't gone extinct in any of these scenarios. Um, and it's showing quite different um, methods of changing the phenotype based on the scenario that's initiated. So in some cases, it's genetic change. Some cases, it's plasticity. Um, and yeah, it really depends on the combination of these two on what scenario has been imposed. So just to summarize and... Thank you, everybody, for my supervisors and the field workers. And that. Do we have some questions? Um, yeah, I think it's probably an artifact of where I start the model off at which population size and with which um, phenotype distribution, um, and then the main trend carries on afterwards. Um, yeah, I think it's so under the, the current climatic conditions, we're still um, seeing that there is some selection for earlier hatching, so even now under the current scenario, it's still more advantageous to go earlier. So I think it might be capturing that slightly. Yeah. Why aren't they um, <laughs> that, I'm not sure. It's probably because um, there are still years where it's later. So then in some cases, it's advantageous to be later. And that's why the plasticity stays. But it's gradually moving earlier. So yeah, I guess it's a bit slower. <laughs> Okay, uh, hi, I'm Rich Howells, a PhD student at Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Edinburgh, but I'm also matriculated at Liverpool. I'm going to talk to you about the first analysis of my PhD. So it's absolutely perfect. No, go. So I start again. I won't say the same, but I'll just start as I am. Um, so climate-induced environmental change. Uh, I don't really need to go through this, but I need to set the scene. Uh, the climate is changing rapidly, uh, but that's with, respo with respect to both long-term mean environmental conditions, such as this sort of hockey stick graph that we're all familiar with, 
But associated with that is changes in short-term weather variability, so the frequency and severity of short-term weather events, such as this huge storm. Um, but studies tend to focus on just one of these effects for various practical reasons. Um, but crucially, populations are affected by both of them simultaneously. Um, the profound changes in many ecosystems um, and at higher trophic levels, in particular top predators, are vulnerable to, well, the two key effects I'll discuss here. Number one is the bottom-up effects of, of, of warming on the distribution, abundance, or phenology of prey that they consume. Uh, but also the short-term weather effects may alter the capacity of a, of a top predator to find, acquire, and capture its food. Um, and that affects diet composition, which in many species is a crucial determinant of demography and fitness. So the North Sea is a study system that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and it's, it, it's had rapid warming over the past 30 years. Um, and that's important because in the North Sea, the sand eel is the dominant mid-tropic fish upon which a lot of the top predators depend. Um, and internationally important seabird, breed in, uh, seabird populations breed in the region. And many people will, will probably have seen a picture of a puffin with a mouthful of sand eel. However, the abundance of sand eel has reduced in recent years, um, and so have the uh, seabird populations. Well, one such population is the European shag, which is the bird I study. Um, previous assessments in the 1980s uh, considered it to be a sand eel specialist, um, but shags' uh, foraging and demography is severely affected by wind conditions. Um, so therefore, shags are affected potentially by both long-term mean environmental change and short-term weather effects. So a good species in which to test some of these questions that I'm interested in. So this is the Isle of May. Um, it's in the Firth of Forth in Scotland. Um, it's not always that sunny. Um, and we have uh, over 30 years of data, so longer than I've been alive. Um, and I have two aims. First of all, if I'm going to study the diet, I need to quantify what it is. And then I'm going to try and test the underlying environmental determinants based on knowledge of the system. So how do we uh, study shag diet? Well, we, we monitor all the nests on the island, um, and then sometimes the birds, uh, uh, that, well, they're sick. Uh, we collect their vomit in a bag, and that's my hand with a, a nice bag of sick. And then from that, we can take it to the lab and uh, look at the otoliths, which are these small little uh, ear bones. Um, we can work out the species composition of each sample and work out the proportional biomass of each prey type. And I've got 30 years of data, uh, 863 samples, and overall 16 different prey types identified. So this is just the, a summary of the diet over the 30 years. Um, sand eel is the most abundant, 80% of samples. But actually, the sand eel comprises two different age classes. Uh, we've got the adult sand eel. So these are ones that are born in previous years and affected by previous year's conditions, presumably. And then juvenile fish, or juvenile sand eel, sorry, that are born in the current year. So they hatch in February and then become sort of adult fish around, the, uh, around middle summer. And then there's a range of other fish which, which are, are far less prevalent in the diet. Um, and what modeling approach I used? Well, it's, I used generalized linear mixed models uh, in R. Um, but because sand eel dominate and the data are proportional, there are problems of uh, interpretation because uh, an effect operating on one proportion, we, you can't distinguish it from uh, the, uh, the, the reciprocal the reciprocal proportion. So what I did is I used different binomial denominators for these three different prey type to allow me to test changes independently. So the first is sand eel against all other prey. So that's the yellow box against the, the black box. And then the relative proportion of different sand eel age classes. So the small uh, is the young of the year, the juvenile sand eel, and then this large adult sand eel. And then finally, the butterfish against all other prey, other non-sand eel prey, sorry. And then I want to test the underlying environmental conditions, or covariates. So I have uh, daily wind and rain, uh, rain, rain effects. I have sand eel abundance would be perfect to use, but actually that data doesn't exist. So what I use is a, uh, proxies of sand eel abundance, including sea surface temperature. And we predict a negative effect of sea surface temperature on survival and uh, recruitment in sand eel. And then also the abundance of Calnus finmarchicus, which is a key uh, food, food source for sand eel. Uh, but because I'm interested not only in the conditions in the current year, I want to test conditions in previous year, I, I, I included lagged effects in this sea surface temperature and, uh, and Calnus finmarchicus abundance. And then finally, I, includes, I included date uh, to account for seasonal changes in conditions across the year. So then, what is diet? I quantified it, and as I said earlier, sand eel dominate at the start of the study, 
Uh, but in 2004, there's this huge change in which the non-sand eel component increases quite dramatically, and it's become far more variable since then. So the proportion of sand eel in the diet has reduced. And then the relative proportion of different sand eel age classes, so the, the, the yellow is the adult sand eel, and the, the orange color is the juvenile sand eel. Um, th they're highly variable, but show no trend o o over the study. And then finally, because we can't identify all prey to species level, I'm just showing you what, what I call prey richness. So this just shows you the, the sort of diversity of prey types exploited in each year. And you can see that at the start of the study, uh, it's sometimes one, that's just sand eel, they ate nothing else. But then in more recent years, is, is far more diverse diet. And then to test the underlying environmental determinants of, of diet composition, well, on the, this is a, uh, for the proportion of sand eel relative to all other prey. And on the x-axis, we can see mean daily wind speed. And what we can see is that it get, as it gets more windy, uh, the proportion of sand eel in the diet is reduced. And then my, my, the next model, well, this is the proportion of adult relative to juvenile sand eel. Uh, on the left-hand side is the inshore sea surface temperature in the previous year. And we can see a, a warm sea surface temperature in the previous year the proportion of adult sand eel relative to not group sand eel uh, reduces. And then the, on the right-hand side is, is the other uh, main effect, is an, a seasonal effect. So as the, the year progresses, the proportion of adult fish in the diet reduces and the proportion of juvenile fish increases. And that happens around July. And then finally, for the proportion of butterfish, butterfish relative to non-sand eel prey, well, we can see again there's an effect of inshore sea surface temperature in the previous year, but this time the proportion of butterfish actually increases with temperature. So in warmer waters in the previous year, there are more butterfish in the diet. And then secondly, this effect of Calnus finmarchicus abundance, what we can see is that a higher abundance of this, of this key food prey, um, it, the, the proportion of butterfish is reduced. So to conclude and, and to try and pick apart that, these effects, well, number one, the proportion of sand eel in the shag diet has reduced dr dramatically over the course of the study. And although highly variable, the, the proportion of different sand eel age classes no, shows no trend. Um, but the number and diversity of prey types in the diet has increased. And this is important because the relative prof profitability and energy content of different fish can have quite profound impacts on reproductive success and potentially survival. And then to look at the sort of environmental determinants, well, what I found is that shag diet is actually related to quite a complex suite of mechanisms relating to short-term weather variability. So a negative effect of wind, as we can see a shag fly in a storm year. So it could be that shag foraging ability is affected by these strong wind effects, or potentially the distribution or availability of sand eel is, is altered. Secondly, we have this long-term effect of mean environmental change and inshore sea surface temperature in the previous year. So there's a negative effect on sand eel. So this could be an effect on sand eel recruitment, survival and thereby abundance, uh, which will affect the proportion of sand eel in the diet. And then secondly, there's a positive effect on the proportion of butterfish in the diet. And what, what's op operating in there, we're not quite sure because the, the life history and ecology of these species is not well known. But what I can show is because of the way I structured the analysis with respect to different binomial denominators, is that these, these effects of temperature are acting independently on both these dietary components. Secondly, there's a negative uh, effect of, of, of Calnus finmarchicus on the abundance of, of, of butterfish in the diet. And again, we're not entirely sure why that could be, but it could be that other, other prey types, uh, other non sand eel prey, uh, are more abundant or, 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 or energy rich during high Calnus finmarchicus abundance. And then finally, a seasonal effect of date. Um, and this, this relates quite nicely to, to sand eel life history because sand eels spend most of their time buried in sand. Um, and the adults are available in the water column uh, during spring, but then retreat back to the, back to the seabed, and at which point they're replaced by these, these juvenile fish that have hatched in the current year. So that fits quite nicely with what we know about the, the ecology of the system. Um, and to summarize and think about it more broadly, I suppose, uh, well, populations are, are vulnerable to both cl climatic effects operating over a range of temporal scales from days to decades. Um, but this might have profound demographic consequences on, on populations, mediated in this case at least, through changes in diet composition. Um, and then finally, it is important when we, we conduct these studies to assess both the effects of long and short term effects, both current and predicted future, when we assess the effects of climate change on wild animal populations. Um, and there's an obligatory nice picture, but I have to thank all the people that collected the vomit over the past 30 years <laughs> and dissected it in a lab and provided me with an excellent PhD. So thanks, guys.
in the model. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure. But the binomial models, they're, they're difficult to get any sort of R squared out of. So we're not sure. They, they seem to model the data well, but I'm not off the top of my head. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. So sand eels, uh, traditionally they were very energy rich, mm -hmm. but c climate change and, and wash warming is reducing the, the, the energy content of sand eel. But crucially, sand eel form huge shoals, whereas rock butterfish are, are completely solitary. So even, uh, even though the rock butterfish are slightly bigger, they're, they're actually less energy rich and also solitary. So the profitability of that prey is, is, is far reduced compared to sand eel, or at least it was when sand eel were energy rich. But we're not quite sure what they are now. So we collect, so yeah, you collect, you collect, the, you collect the, the sample, um, and what we do then, we take it back to the to the, to the lab, and we digest it in uh, washing powder, so biological washing powder that you'd use to wash your clothes, um, and what that does is it, it digests all the all the mucus, all all the f uh, tissue, and then from that we can find these ear bones, and they're species or uh, you know sometimes species specific, and we can look through the microscope then and identify each otolith. Um, we are, I think we have uh, millions of them, so yeah. yeah. to sing for three minutes. Who's going to sing? <laughs> it's um, me, me Brown. <laughs> Okay, good morning everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about um, invertebrate community traits um, in pretty nice environments like this. This is a pasture, so glass here in Austria. Um, so some of our data comes from this environment. Um, so by way of background then, um, it's, it's, been, it's been said for quite a long time really that if we want to understand large scale biodiversity patterns then uh, and we want to develop a mechanistic understanding, then we probably need to be looking at traits, species traits, rather than the actual uh, identity of species. Because if you go between different biogeographic zones, then you're going to find different species pools, and therefore if you look at the traits, you might see similarities in the way they respond, uh, independently of the, the, the biodiversity. So, um, you know, as 
papers here that relate to just before I started my PhD, just before I was born, and then well, ages ago. Um, so, but you know, this idea has been around a long time, and the plant scientists in particular have been at the forefront of this this thinking. Um, there have been quite a few uh, high-profile, so top journal papers recently talking again about plants and global scale understanding of, of plant traits. Um, also mammals, fish, and, and marine phytoplankton, uh, some of the, in the last five years or so. Um, but through the course of this study, we, we've not really found any evidence yet for global scale studies for invertebrates fun focusing on traits and, and similarities or, or otherwise in their patterns. If anybody knows of any, please inform me and, and then we can work this in as we write this up. But we, this is really important because invertebrates account for over 95% of all the animal diversity on Earth. They play really significant roles as primary consumers or decomposers. And they're a significant threat of extinction. Um, there was a ZSL report out last year, I think, which, which sort of really, really sort of brought this into focus. Uh, so we sort of here we're, we're asking the question, are they globally coherent drivers of invertebrate traits and functional diversity? Okay, so, so the way we, we get at this we, we start thinking about glacier retreat. We know that glacier retreat is happening globally and it's been accelerating for the last 50 years. So here's a system in Alaska that we work on. I'll work on a site stream off the side of this actually, but this is looking up um, Glacier Bay and this is, the, this is what was called Muir Glacier. You see how much it's gone back. In terms of scale, it's about seven kilometers to that little bit of well, I say little, but that's a huge glacier in the corner, and it's about two kilometers across this coastal fjord. So that's the scale of retreat in, in that one place. Um, but over the last 10, 20 years, there's been a lot of in, um, interest in understanding what the effects are on river systems and, and river invertebrate biodiversity in particular. So, so we have this global phenomenon, but we also have information from what we like, if you like, model systems, rivers. So as we, as we move from heavily glacierized through retreating glaciers into, into clear water systems, there's this pretty, pretty neat progression of the river system. And that progression in terms of deglacierization relates really, really nicely to changes in the stream habitat or river habitat. So uh, from this stream here, which is again in Alaska, we have these records that have been collected over the last 30 years or so of showing strong increases in temperature, strong decreases in turbidity, which is a measure of suspended sediment in the water. Um, and we also see similar patterns as the temperature when we look at the stability of the channel. So it becomes more stable as the glacierization decreases. So by glacierization here, I'm talking about the, the percentage coverage of the, of the river catchment that has that is covered in glacial ice. So I said there's been these coordinator studies since, since, the, since the 90s. So um, I was started working on this as part of my PhD about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And we published this in 2007, showing responses here of mayfly, stonefly, and caddisfly genera richness as glacial influence dropped off. Um, more recently, we pooled data sets from, from three biogeographic zones here, and we published this in Nature Climate Change. So this is sort of taxonomic richness, um, showing increases in richness as we lose glacier cover, but a peak uh, about around about 20, between 30 and 10%, but roughly about 20% where it then sort of drops off uh, slightly. Um, so most of these studies here, then we've got these data sets from lots of different locations around the world, but so far we've only really been looking at population or community structural responses in, in these different locations. In Alaska, where we have studied one stream, well, I say we, my, my colleagues have studied them from before I was born, um, and I sort of picked it up in, in recent times, much similar to the last talk, actually. Um, so here, this is one stream where the glacier has retreated over these last 30, 40 years, and it's been sampled roughly, well, pretty much every year. Um, and using those data sets, we've been able to look at traits and, and functional diversity and show that the number of traits increases and sort of levels off as we get to around zero cover, increases in functional diversity here as a, a measure of functional richness. 
So uh, we start to ask the question, well, we see these taxonomic responses worldwide. Maybe are we going to see the same when we start to look at the traits and, and the functional diversity? So here's what we did, which has taken probably about two years to get to this stage, and I'll, I'll tell you some results from the first pass of the analysis that we completed on Friday. Um, so we have invertebrate data, larval stage data, and linked environmental data sets. Um, from 494 samples in these nine ge biogeographic zones. It accounts to almost 1.3 million individual invertebrates. Um, it's a quite nice data set to be playing with, actually. Um, Eagle-eyed members of the audience will notice that there are 10 circles on here, but we have two data sets from the European Alps, so they've been merged in, in the analysis going forward. And time scales. Um, span 78 to 2013, but within each zone, the streams have pretty much been sampled at the same time, with the exception of Alaska, which is a, a time series. So, so like I said, there are these, there are these 10 locations. Nine of them are sort of chrono sequence, space for time um, data sets, and the one from southeast Alaska in Glacier Bay is a time series that's been collected for the 30, 30 years plus. Now, in each, um, each location, the, the tax lists that were provided were quite variable. So we sort of standardized to genera level for the Chironomidae. Um, these were identified quite, quite, um, quite a lot of the time to species, but the traits information are not, not that well developed. So we um, amalgamated these up to subfamily level. Um, and that's allowed us to, to have similar, similar data sets for all these 10, 10 locations. Uh, the samples, most locations provided quantitative sample data, so a SERB sampler or a HES, for those of you who are aquatic scientists and know what these are. Four of the locations provided kick samples, which are semi-quantitative timed um, disturbances of, of the stream bed. And we pick up invertebrates that look like this. At the top here, we've got chironomid larvae. In the middle, you have a Delitidium mayfly larvae, which are um, endemic to New Zealand. And then at the bottom, we've got some um, pearlid stoneflies, so some of the larger invertebrate predators. But the problem was, we got this great invertebrate data set, but the traits data are not globally coherent. So this is what's been taking up most of our time. Created a fuzzy coded traits database, then using information from Taché, Europe, Philips, New Zealand, and POF. So some uh, European and um, New Zealand ones were fuzzy coded, but the European one, I think, was between 0 and 5. The New Zealand ones between 0 and 3. And the North American one was binary. So we spent quite a lot of time backwards and forwards in between experts trying to work this out. We focused on these eight, eight traits and these different um, modalities of the traits. And, and these are the traits that we've used and been able to, to code up. Uh, for, uh, coded between zero for no affinity and, and three for a strong affinity. So and then we've calculated a, a suite of functional diversity metrics, which I've, I'll not go into here because I'll use all my time explaining what they are, but I'm happy to talk about those later if need be. Um, moving on to some of the results then. Um, these are, so we, we put the raw trait, uh, the transform the abundance data log 10 because it's quite variable. Um, we've put the traits and the invertebrate um, abundance information into a fuzzy correspondence analysis to try and look at trait patterns and pull out if there's any spatial patterning. So if we take the first axis score of that fuzzy correspondence analysis and plot it against glacier cover, we're getting these quite nice patterns for, for, for quite a few of the regions. There's a bit of noise in, in some locations um, that we still need to work on, but quite a few of them are showing this nice nice sort of pattern in terms of shift along the FCA axis one as glacier cover drops off, so, so moving this way. Okay. When we look at the underlying trait database then, the, the, these uh, patterns are driven predominantly, of, so these are the traits that are loaded most heavily on that first axis, a, a shift towards longer life cycles, for, so from multivolt time through to semi or univolt time, an increase in herbivory, decrease in fine particulate uh, 
filtering or collecting an uh, increase in coarse particulate shredding, decreases in um, pupation within the river, an increase in invertebrates that have no pupation at all, and decrease in burrow activity and crawler activity. So these are some of the central traits that the analysis is, is pointing us towards as being coherent responses across, across these zones, these different zones. We look at functional richness, so as a sort of um, a measurement of the, the, the overall trait space. And here what we've done, we've, we've standardized within region here and calculated functional richness because obviously not all the species occur in all different regions and some of the traits are maybe absent. So, so here we've standardized within region and then, and then plotted all these together. Again, we, we're, getting a, um, we're getting a significant um, coherent response across this, this glacial gradient, increase in functional richness as we lose glacier cover. Um, if we look at functional dispersion uh, as the next one, so this is how the abundances are, are sort of um, dispersed throughout the trait space. This, the patterns here are much stronger. Um, so again, we're seeing this, this strong increase in, in pretty much all of these regions of an increase in functional dispersion as glacier cover declines. So then what we did, we said, okay, well, let's look at the sort of, um, all the traits data together. Let's create a functional space for the whole data set and then pull out the values for each individual region. And when we do that, we see, see this really nice latitudinal pattern for functional dispersion. We see it for richness as well, but it's not quite as strong. So essentially what we're seeing is this drop off of dispersion. So th there's still strong glacial signature underneath this, but the, the, the dispersion drops off the closer we get to the poles. Okay, so, so out of that overall trait space, uh, as we get closer to the poles, even though there's a glacial effect, it, the sort of amount of that trait space that's taken up is getting much, much smaller. So um, I can sort of see time's running out. So, um, so just to summarize what we've, what we've found so far um, are these what look like globally congruent directional responses of traits and functional diversity to glacial retreat. Um, it's predominantly for ri functional richness and uh, dispersion, evenness and divergence are not, not showing us any, any response, interestingly. So we're still trying to work out why this is. Uh, the traits respond to environmental gradients similarly across these biogeographic, biogeographic zones, despite them having quite different species pools and, and, and different pools of genera even when you scale up. Um, so glacial retreat seems for, for river uh, invertebrates, benefits organisms with longer life cycles, which probably um, relates to a need to... Um, less need to complete the life cycle really quickly to get through that, that melt season. If you're sort of moving into a system that's less likely to freeze or dry up, then you've got to take longer, perhaps. We see more non-insect taxa moving in, worms, oligochaetes predominantly, but um, this no pupation increase also relates to invertebrates such as stoneflies and mayflies, which skip the pupation phase. They sort of go from the larvae to the adult without uh, fully pupating. And then perhaps there are some underlying food web shifts as well, driving some of these patterns. So successional dynamics, well, this is what we're thinking about at the moment, seem to be driven not only by the, the change in niche space, the, the sort of habitat, but there also seems to be differences in how, uh, how that niche space is being utilized. So, so the dispersion example for, um, shows that the, the sort of changes in the abundance distributions in that niche space. These monotic increases um, compare quite com compared to the taxonomic responses, which I showed you were sort of more unimodal. So functional di uh, diversity can perhaps better differentiate the extremes because we're not sort of dropping over and, and coming back down into into a, a lower level of functional diversity as we get to zero glacier cover. A significant latitudinal effect showing this realized trait space is narrowing. And so what we're sort of thinking, uh, or, or our main conclusion is that we think trait-based approaches offer good potential for understanding how invertebrates respond to, to global environmental change. Okay, thanks. That was a really nice
that talk. Uh, and hopefully tonight it's uh, Laura Gray. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some work that we've done um, trying to identify whether novel and disappearing hummingbird communities will form under climate change. Um, so, so here we've got um, some sort of historical climate change um, and they've found that we get these, um, these novel climates, which are climates that exist in the future, well, exist now that didn't exist in the past, and disappearing climates which, um, which previously existed and don't anymore. Um, and it's um, suggested this will actually this will happen under climate change as well. So in the future, we'll get these new novel climate spaces, and we'll lose some climate spaces. Um, so this has implications for ecological communities in the way that they um, will adjust um, their ranges based on climate. So if we think about this uh, sort of the current climate space with these sort of two hypothetical climate variables, um, and then we add in a community of um, three. Well, we add in three species to this. Um, where the um, species overlap with the climate space, um, that's where they are present, and where they overlap with each other, it's where they coexist. So in the current climate space, we've got species one and species three um, coexisting, um, but species two and species three do not. But then if we move into um, sort of a um, projected future climate scenario, um, we get this disappearing climate effect um, at the sort of top of the um, plot there, um, and where the two um, ovals overlap, that's sort of where we've got similar climate spaces. Um, so here we, we lose the um, community of species one and species three, um, so that's a disappearing community, and then we gain a community, species two and species three, um, which is the novel community. So where people have looked at this for, um, for future climate, um, they've mostly focused on um, how this will affect um, taxonomic diversity, so whether we see novel and disappearing taxonomic communities. Um, but it's important to look at other dimensions of diversity. So we um, wanted to look at whether we get novel and disappearing phylogenetic communities, because it gives us information about the evolu evolutionary potential and shared histories, um, and also the um, w uh, functional dimension of diversity, um, because it gives you some information about um, ecological resilience, um, um, ecosystem function and services. So the questions that we um, were, were trying to answer is, will we see these novel and disappearing assemblages under future climates, and where will they be? Um, where will they be along an environmental gradient? Um, and then are the um, different dimensions of diversity coupled? Um, so we had sort of um, three predictions of how this could work. So we didn't necessarily compare with taxonomic diversity because as the smallest sort of unit of measurement that we were using, it was always going to have the few, the most likely to have novel and disappearing. But between phy phylogenetic and functional, they could either be exactly the same if traits are strictly conserved across a phylogeny, or um, we could see um, them differing with each other. So we used the study site of Ecuador, which has a um, strong precipitation gradient ranging from, from the eastern uh, wet lowlands over to the west. And it also has a strong elevational gradient um, with the Andes running down the middle of the country. So our workflow was that we created current and future assemblage lists um, using species distribution modeling. Um, we then calculated for each, um, for each grid cell within um, the study site um, between time beta diversity. So for every cell, we calculated um, the biodiversity between current and future assemblage list. Um, and then we used these to calculate the number of grid cells, a number of analogues, current and future analogues for each grid cell. So for the species distribution models, we used an ensemble approach. Um, we used um, temperature, precipitation, and precipitation variability to project into um, 2070 for several... Um, circulation models, and we used um, point localities of 151 hummingbird species, and then we stacked these SDMs to get the species lists. And then for each um, pairwise combination of current and future, um, we calculated um, beta diversity measures. So for taxonomic diversity, we calculated the Sorensen dissimilarity, which gives you the proportion of shared species. 
Um, for phylogenetic beta diversity, we um, calculated the phylosaur measure, which is an analogue to the um, Sorensen measure, and it gives you the proportion of shared branches. And then for functional beta diversity, we used um, bill length, mass, and wing cord, and calculated the mean nearest neighbour distance. And then to calculate the actual number of current and future analogues for each cell, we took these um, pairwise combinations of um, beta diversity measures, and then for each cell, um, so, so in the top row we've got the cur current, um, a current cell, um, we um, created the frequency of um, beta diversity values, and then for anything below this um, threshold of 0.2, which is where 80% um, of species are shared, or 80% of species taxonomy, um, phylogeny, or function is shared, um, we considered those two communities analogous. Um, and then we plotted it back into space, um, and um, here, so the, um, for the first one, we don't get any analogue cells, so that one's considered a novel community, and those are represented by the uh, black grid cells. And then for the bottom one, there are some um, analogues, so um, we also um, have plotted out the gradient as to how many analogues there are, which gives you an idea as to how close to um, novel or disappearing a community might be. So our first um, set of results here for um, how many um, current analogues there are for each grid cell. This gives you the, the novel communities. So we actually find that we get quite a lot of um, taxonomic novel communities down the, um, um, in the high elevation areas in the Andes. Um, and this pattern's pretty similar for the phylogenetic and functional, but we see fewer phylogenetic um, uh, novel communities and then even fewer than that functional. So then for the, um, for the disappearing communities, here we find that um, the same pattern actually happens, but we only find disappearing taxonomic co communities. And for the others, they're, um, again, in the, in the high elevations, they're close to disappearing, but um, not by our um, definition. And then in, for, for both of these, in the, um, in the eastern wet lowlands, we actually find that there are there are many analogues between current and future, um, which suggests that the communities there are quite resistant. And then we were interested in comparing the um, uh, functional and phylogenetic, and we actually found that for 90% of the grid cells, um, there was always more functional um, current and future analogues, which suggests that um, um, functional diversity is much more um, resistant under climate change there. Um, and then um, the last of the results here are um, we wanted to compare how many, um, how many novel and disappearing communities there are. And um, we actually find that in the, um, in the lowlands, um, you're more likely to have more current um, analogues. So that means that they're less likely to um, have novel um, communities. And then in the slopes of the Andes, in the um, eastern um, area, there's um, more future analogues, so it's much less likely to have disappearing communities. I'm trying to sort of unpack the implications of that. Um, I seem to have gone through quite quickly because I'm already at my conclusion slide. But, um, so what we found was that the novel, uh, novel assemblages are likely for all of the dimensions of diversity, whereas for disappearing we only really see these um, for taxonomic diversity and where they're close to um, um, close to being disappearing, they tend to be at the high elevations. Um, and they, yeah, the environmental gradient we see is that novel and disappearing assemblages are most likely at high elevations and also in, um, in the drier lowlands um, in the west. Um, and also, um, we generally see more functional than phylogenetic analogues, um, which suggests that depending on the sort of conservation issue at hand, um, it has different implications. So, um, for, um, for say, um, conservation of taxonomic um, diversity and um, taxonomic uh, communities, um, climate change could pose a real problem, but we see sort of, for functional diversity, it tends to be um, fairly sort of like well um, held across climate change. Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening and I um, just want to thank my colleagues for sort of help with uh, compiling and cleaning the data 
and um, for comments on the manuscript. And the project was funded by a NASA grant and an NSF grant. No, they don't. Um, Oh, okay. So, um, so the question was that the models don't take into account the fact that um, the species might be dispersal limited, so they might not actually um, fill the ranges. So, at the moment, I, um, it's it's something that would be really nice to do, and it, um, I've sort of thought previously about. Um, incorporating dispersal into species distribution models. Uh, it's not something that I've um, started working on yet. yet. Um, but one of the things um, I was worried about with it was um, some of these species sort of like that are being projected to move up probably can't sort of physiologically. But I did speak to, so um, Don Powers, who commented on the manuscript, he's a physiologist and he actually said he didn't think it would necessarily be a problem. But I agree dispersal could well be an issue, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Definitely species interactions are going to be really important in there. And I think what would actually be quite useful for this is um, as one of, the, um, one of the predictors in the model, it would be useful to have, say, future, um, like a future projection of the plant communities. But obviously that in itself has its own issues. But yeah, I agree. It would be a very useful thing to have in there and to help improve the realistic um, nature of the model. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, so there are some joint species distribution models out there, but they're quite intractable if once you go above about, I think it's something like seven species, and I had 151, so it was, um, yeah, not, not um, yeah, it's difficult balancing off what's computationally possible against what's, what's realistic. Uh, but on the, on the ground, do people know that, and I don't know anything about hummingbirds, I'm afraid, but uh, where, where there are some species uh, occupy a place and then locally uh, push out another I think I think people are looking at it. So one of the um, one of the co-authors on this paper, he's been um, he's been setting up some camera traps to look at actual interactions between between the birds and the flowers. But um, he has seen some sort of interesting competitive behaviour between between hummingbird species. So I think people are looking at that. Yeah. Thank you. I don't have any good jokes, I'm sorry. <laughs> A bad one. For sure.
Um, okay, so I'd, I'd just like to talk to you about an experiment that's, um, that I did earlier this year, um, working with uh, all of these people here, uh, and looking at the impacts of drought on floral resources and on pollinators. So the climate's certainly changing, and uh, we've already heard about some of the ways in which it's expected to change. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, one of the main ways in which it's expected to change is in terms of there being more frequent extreme weather events, so things like heat waves and things like droughts. Mm. And this horizon scan was published earlier this year, which I tried to identify some of the, the, the key future threats towards pollinators. And the, the, the increasing threat of drought due to climate change was identified as one of the key threats. So hopefully that's enough of a reason to kind of convince you that it's something that we should be looking into. So how is drought likely to affect pollinators? Well, probably not uh, particularly directly because pollinators are getting their source of water through foraging on nectar. So what we're really interested in are these kind of indirect effects. So you can imagine that uh, in a kind of uh, an environment where water is a limiting factor, um, plants are water stressed, they're probably performing worse and putting fewer resources into reproduction uh, in terms of producing flowers and pollen and nectar. And this means less food for pollinators essentially. And you'd expect that there'd be some studies already looking at these effects, uh, and there are. Um, but what's worth noting is that most of these studies find uh, quite different mechanisms uh, behind how drought affects these things. So a bunch of studies looking at how drought affects nectar production, uh, looking at volume of nectar, looking at sugar production of nectar. Some studies find that one is affected, some that both are affected or neither are affected. Um, but then the key thing to note is that most of these studies then don't actually relate these effects to pollinators. Uh, and, and even more important is that most of these experiments have been done in kind of arid or semi-arid environments uh, where droughts are, are quite common. And, and that makes a lot of sense. But with climate change, we expect that the drought's going to be an increasing threat in additional regions, um, such as in the UK and across much of Europe. So uh, this is kind of a bit of a gap. We need to extend these studies. So the, the, the main aim of our study was to, to, to look at the effects of drought upon floral resources. Uh, and then upon pollinators. And um, we wanted to do this at uh, kind of three different spatial scales. So uh, at the flower scale, looking at individual flowers, we wanted to see how drought affects uh, production of nectar in terms of volume and, and sugar concentration. And then we want to look at how plants are investing in over multiple flowers. Uh, so we're looking at the, the racing scale, which just means the kind of branch scale. Uh, and we want to see how drought affects the number of flowers and also the sugar production in nectar over, over a racine. And then more broadly, we want to look at the community scale. So looking at how drought affects floral resources in terms of diversity and abundance, and then also how this affects um, visits by invertebrates to flowers. So we did our experiment on Cranbourne Chase in Wiltshire. Uh, you can see the kind of habitat that surrounds the field site here. So it's quite agriculturally intensive, but we've got kind of pockets of semi-natural habitat knocking around. Um, and the habitat type here is chalk grassland, and this is deemed to be a really important habitat type for pollinators. Um, it, it supports really diverse pollinator communities and, and wildflower communities. And just for example, this paper that's published earlier this year in Nature concluded that, that chalk grassland was one of the most productive habitat types in terms of nectar. And we were very fortunate to, to be able to use an existing experimental design that was actually set up by Ellen Fry and Richard Bargett from the University of Manchester. And basically what Ellen and Richard have done is to create this, um, this, this wildflower community or kind of a plant community, but it actually contains pretty much all of the wildflowers that you'd find in, in your average wildflower seed mixture. Uh, and yeah, they seeded this site back in 2013, at which point it was it had been previously used for agriculture and was essentially bare earth, and very quickly developed into this really diverse plant community. And you can see by now we've got well, here's just a subsample of the, the kind of diversity of wildflowers that we see there. And then what they did was to create these 42 experimental plots across this site. So we've got kind of eight meter squared plots. Um, and then within each, within each of these plots, we've got three subplots, which are the three treatments. So firstly, we've got a drought treatment. So we're trying to simulate drought. So basically what they did was to put roofs, uh, a roof over, the, over these plots, uh, as you can see in this photo. Um, and this means that when it rains, rather than the water getting to the plants underneath, it should flow off either side. And then we've got a roof control. Um, so this is the same roof, but this time with holes in, and this is actually one with holes in, you can see in the zoomed in image. Uh, so most of the water should, should get through and reach the plants beneath. Uh, but the purpose of this is to try and control for some of the other effects of having a roof. So you might expect slightly lower light intensity, slightly higher humidity. 
Um, but in actual fact, not all water does get through, so it also represents a kind of very, a very low level of, of, of drought. And then we just have a straight up control treatment, which is just without, without a roof. And these roofs were applied for six weeks, and then we collect our data uh, immediately after they're removed. So we wanted to look at how drought affected nectar. So rather than trying to look at, try and collect nectar from every different plant species at the site, we just focused upon three different species. And we just chose the species that were widely available and what we could actually extract nectar from fairly easily. And then uh, based on a few other things like different floral traits. Um, and then what we did was to randomly select raceemes of these plant species to, to cover them with a mesh bag for 24 hours to stop uh, pollinators and invertebrates from visiting those flowers. Um, and then we recorded how many flowers were there after 24 hours, and we, uh, we measured nectar in terms of volume and sugar concentration. And then for our kind of community level study, we, we basically did surveys in, uh, in quadrats on every single one of these subplots of all these treatments. Uh, and we initially did a floral survey, so we identified all of the flowering plant species that were in, in the quadrat, and we counted the number of floral units based on previously used criteria. Um, and then we immediately followed this with a, with a pollinator survey. So for 10 minutes, we observed um, which species of invertebrates are visiting flowers, uh, which plant species are they visiting, and then how many times are they visiting the, these flowers. So what did we find? Well, firstly, let's, let's look at the flower scale. Um, we found that drought resulted in more empty flowers, um, despite the fact that they'd been bagged for 24 hours. So it wasn't that, that invertebrates had been drinking this nectar, it was actually that these flowers were, were unproductive. Um, but actually, when we looked at the characteristics of nectar in flowers that did contain nectar, we didn't find differences in, in volume or sugar concentration. And I think this is quite an interesting finding, given the existing literature, especially given that uh, producing a proportion of empty flowers is, is seen as a kind of cheap strategy on the part of the plant. Um, but all I say is that maybe this suggests that plants are diverting resources from some flowers in order to maintain nectar in other flowers, which potentially is, is a more beneficial strategy um, than having poorer quality nectar in the first place, especially given that the number of empty flowers might be very high naturally um, it, when you don't bag them in a kind of natural setting. And then at the raceme scale, we found that drought resulted in slightly fewer flowers per raceme, but as you can see, uh, it's not a particularly clear effect for all of the species that we looked at, um, but certainly a kind of weak effect overall. And then all of these effects that I've described so far accumulated in there being lower sugar production per raceme, so it's just an accumulation of being fewer flowers, and then those flowers being less likely to contain nectar. And then at the community scale, we found that drought resulted in uh, a significant effect on floral diversity, but um, if you just look at this graph, uh, the direction's not quite clear, and also the strength of the effect is quite small. Um, but what we certainly did find is that there were substantially fewer flora units in the drought treatment. So you can see this box plot down here is really quite dramatically different to in the other treatments. And this obviously relates very closely with, with the amount of nectar and pollen that's available quite generally. Um, and what I should really reinforce uh, at this point is that Based upon this graph, you might get the impression that plants in the drought treatment are doing really poorly and that they're, they're wilted or they're, they're borderline at the end of their lives. But actually, these plants are doing okay. And if in the field, it's quite hard to tell the difference between uh, plants in the different treatments. So I think what this suggests is that actually, with some environmental stress, one of the first things that plants do is to take resources away from producing uh, nexo pollen uh, flowers and probably reinvest those in, into, into surviving for the time being. And then trying to relate this to, to flower visitors, well, we didn't find a significant effect on visitor diversity. Uh, we found a, a kind of weak effect on, on a visitation rate, um, but because the visitation rates were so low overall, uh, and because our survey duration was quite short, um, it was quite hard to pin this down to an effect on any particular taxonomic group, as you can see here. And these are quite broad groups, but to, to take this to any lower level just becomes meaningless information. Um, but, but I think what's worth emphasizing here is that this is, this is a choice experiment. Um, and although it's maybe interesting, it, it's not really representative of what's happening in, in real life. So in a real drought scenario, the entire landscape is effectively the drought treatment. Um, and I think it just highlights the kind of difficulties involved in trying to translate these, these short-term effects um, into, into kind of population or longer-term effects. Potentially, this is where modeling needs to come in. 
So just to summarize our, our key results, while well, we found that drought resulted in fewer flowers containing nectar, in slightly fewer flowers per raceme, and in lower sugar production per raceme, and then certainly in substantially fewer flowers in the community overall. So we found negative effects on floral resources at multiple scales, and obviously overall these will have a, quite a large overall effect. So just to conclude, well, I think this experiment has demonstrated that with climate change, which is predicted to, to result in um, more regular periods of drought, this is going to mean that um, there'll be periods of time when floral resources uh, are, are scarce. And this obviously has immediate consequences for, for communities of pollinators, has consequences for populations in subsequent years. And these things will affect the pollination service that's provided, which could be uh, quite a motivating factor to be thinking about this if, if we're thinking about agricultural landscapes, particularly if there's mass flowering crops or just other flowering crops around. Um, because of this, it's just an additional pressure on, on pollinators and on uh, the availability of forage for pollinators. So it just really highlights the importance of maintaining whatever habitat we've got left and trying to restore uh, further habitat. Um, and then finally, it just re-emphasizes the importance of this research um, looking into uh, potential sources of ecological resilience, um, so things like promoting diverse plant and pollinator communities. Um, but in, in the case of this study, we can do more obvious things, just like identifying species of plant that are drought, drought tolerant and try to incorporate these into, into wildflower margins and into wildflower seed mixes, which can at least provide us a kind of level of insurance um, given these extreme weather events. Um, so finally, I'd just like to say thank you to, to everyone listed here, uh, especially to Ros Shaw and Juliet Osborne, who are my supervisors, and, uh, and then to Ellen and Richard, who allowed us to work on their, their experiment and really allowed us to jump in and get some interesting data. Yeah, so we didn't, uh, I can say from uh, visually in the field, there didn't appear to be a difference between these flowers. Uh, we didn't look at anything like biomass. Um, so I'm not sure what the, the mechanism behind this would be. Um, the, there is this idea in the literature that um, plants produce a number of empty flowers as a kind of cheat strategy and that this could be achieved through, through flower age. So it's possible that if these flowers are just in worse condition, then this condition is related to, to their next production. So it could increase and then just drop off all of a sudden. And perhaps being, being water stressed just means that they, they mature more quickly, potentially. But not sure of the particular mechanism. Mm. Oh, I was just thinking about uh, you said perhaps the flowers are efficient, but perhaps they are changing to uh, like more male virus uh, strategy. They're exporting pollen rather than producing, expecting to produce uh, fruit. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Um, I couldn't give you a portion off the top of my head, but probably, uh, well, actually, it, it depends on what you call a pollinator first and foremost. Um, so, probably, probably roughly two thirds, I'd say. Um, it, what I didn't say was that. Um, it was quite typical of what, which pollinator species were, were visiting which plant species. Um, so, for example, in our study species, Onobrigus fichifolia, which is a common sandthorn, was almost exclusively visited by, by bumblebees. Um, but yeah, we also included things like Hemiptera, but we include, uh, yeah, most of the flies were, were Aristalis, which most people wouldn't, would, would call pollinators. So. So are you suggesting that, I'm not 
So what you're su suggesting that we could select that through natural selection, more resilient species could evolve. Ah, sorry, I see what you mean. Um, but I would expect that those were the drought resistant species in that, at least from the evidence that I've, that I've shown, I believe that only those drought resilient species will actually produce any flowers under, under any case of a drought scenario um, because it seems like uh, production of flowers because it's reproduction, it's kind of optional, um, is the first thing that drops out with any kind of environmental pressure. Um, so that's what I would think. Thank you very much. Well, the answer is definitely not this. And this guy agrees. If you want to, those of you coming at the back, want to let us see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm also going to talk about drought. Um, so uh, climate change can impact on uh, soil communities, so microbial communities, really uh, via uh, a variety of mechanisms. So climate change, and in particular uh, drought, but also changes in temperature, can impact directly on soil communities um, and thereby affect their functioning. And we know from previous work that fungi are generally more resistant to extreme events such as drought than bacteria. And this is because they can redistribute moisture through the hyphae. Um, but, but climate change, um, drought, but also elevated CO2 and changes in temperature uh, can also affect plant community composition. And we know that um, in general, slow growing plants uh, tend to be or should be more resistant, uh, for example, to drought uh, than fast growing plants because they can invest in more um, tougher structural um, tissues. Um, but these changes in plant communities during or after drought obviously also ha can have implications for the soil communities because the plant roots affect the soil environment, for example, through water uptake, but also through uh, below ground transfer, transfer of carbon. However, we don't really know how this then affects how the soil community is affected by drought. Um, and we particularly don't really know how this affects the recovery of these soil communities. And so this is important because changes in soil communities can affect soil functioning and can actually feed back to climate change, for example, by producing CO2. So um, our hypothesis was that plant communities dominated by slow growing resource conservative species are more resistant to drought and would thereby buffer the effects of drought on soil communities and their functioning. So we set up a field-based mesocosm experiment and um, as in the previous talk, we simulated drought by these uh, roofs that you can see here. So this was quite uh, an undertaking. So you can see uh, the scale of the experiment here. And this experiment was actually um, on top of a hill very close to Lancaster University. You can see sort of the tower of Lancaster University here. And on the horizon, you should sort of be able to see Blackpool Tower here, <coughs> but you can't really see it. So this was on top of a hill and we had uh, really a variety of weather conditions, as you can see here, from really hot to really wild. And so these pots also experienced all these weather conditions. Uh, but obviously we were simulating drought here. Um, and we constructed nine different plant communities so we had low evenness, medium evenness, and high evenness plant communities that all consisted of four species in varying abundances. So we had a slow growing grass, Anthoxanthum moderatum. We had a fast growing grass, Dactylus glomerata. We had a slow growing herb, Leontodon hispidus. And we had a fast growing herb, Brumex acetosa. And so these four species all were sort of um, abundant in one of the low evenness treatments and also abundant in one of the high evenness, medium evenness treatments. And they were planted in equal abundance in the high evenness treatment. And these pots, these treatments were replicated four times. So we imposed um, a drought in the second growing season of these communities. Um, and we sampled uh, the plant communities. We sampled the microbial communities and characterized them by sequencing. Uh, we looked at a range of functional genes involved in the nitrogen cycle, and we also measured processes like photosynthesis, respiration, 
uh, and nitrous oxide and methane emissions. So we measured all these things before we imposed the drought, at the end of the drought, and during recovery, so one week after ending the drought and two months after ending the drought. Um, so first I'm going to show you what is happening above ground. So at the left, you can see um, really the communities as we planted them during the first growing season. And so you can see here the low evenness treatments, the medium evenness treatment, and the high evenness treatment. And it's just really clear that the amphoxanthum dominated treatments are really dominated by amphoxanthum, which is in red. And the ductilus treatments dominated by ductilus, leontodon treatments dominated by leontodon, and the rumex treatments dominated by rumex in the low evenness treatment. So this is obviously um, a bit less clear in the medium evenness treatment and the high evenness treatment really was sort of quite, quite even. Um, however, before we imposed a drought, you can really see that really all these plant communities had become really very amphoxanthum dominated. So this is the slow growing grass. So, and then these two graphs show what the control and the drought communities look like after the drought. So this is actually two months after ending the drought. So what you can see here in the control treatments that actually the pods weren't as dominated by anthoxanthum anymore. So the red is really gone down uh, a bit and actually ductulus, which is the orange one, has started to dominate. But what you can see in the drought communities is that really they are really almost all very strongly do dominated by ductulus. Um, and also as a result of that uh, ductilus dominance that actually the biomass in the drought treatment is slightly higher than in the control treatment. So these communities have really shifted strongly in response to drought um, with an increase in the fast growing grass, ductilus. So interestingly, um, the change in plant community composition was actually uh, highest when there wasn't really any initial anthroxanthin present. So initially, when there was a high uh, anthroxanthin biomass, so the slow growing grass, these communities were really resistant to the effects of drought. Okay, so now I'm gonna go below ground. Um, and here you can see just um, the effect of drought on both the fungal and the bacterial communities. Um, so uh, this is the sequence uh, through time. So this is before the drought. You can see that for fungi and bacteria, there's no effect of drought, fortunately. And then at the end of the drought, for both bacteria and fungi, you can see that they, these communities are really strongly affected by drought. And that, that this effect is really still present at the end of the, uh, the, the two-month recovery period. Um, and in addition, fungi were actually also fungal community was also affected by the planted dominant species. Um, and this is just looking um, in a different way to these changes in fungal and bacterial communities. So this is showing the diversity. And so at the left, you can see that um, at the end of the drought, really fungal diversity is strongly increased, but it recovers really quickly. And here it doesn't uh, uh, differ from the, from the control anymore. But in contrast, bacterial diversity, okay, so it decreases, but it decreases really, really strongly one week after ending the drought, and it remains really strongly decreased two months after this drought has ended. So a really, really strong effect, particularly on the bacteria and particularly uh, persistent over time. So I'm going to focus on these two recovery treatments now. So one week after ending the drought, and two months after ending the drought. And so this is quite a complicated graph, but what this shows you is um, a circular uh, taxonomic tree with the different phyla in different colors for bacteria. And this ring here is showing the fold change of these OTUs that you can see here. Um, and in the case that these have green dots, that means that they are higher in control treatments, so that they're reduced by drought. And when they have red dots, that means that they are actually increased in the drought treatment. And so this outer ring is showing the overall abundance of, of these OTUs. And so what you can see is particularly species really have high abundance, but also strongly increase in the drought treatment. And these, um, these OTUs, these uh, taxa are indicated in red here. So this is one week after the end of the drought. 
And this is two months after the end of the drought. And so you can see that certain clades, really, certain um, entire clades of bacterial taxa continue to be increased in the drought treatment, and that these really persist, in, so these, especially these, this genus DA101, but also the Bradyrhizobium, um, the Mycobacterium, they, these really persist um, being increased in the drought treatments. So these are really sort of indicator taxa, uh, in bacterial indicator taxa for drought. And so interestingly, these indicator taxa, two months after ending the drought, are all uh, correlated to plant community composition. So all to a, to a varying degree, obviously these R squares are not very strong, but they're all significantly correlated to plant community composition two months after ending the drought, which uh, suggests that this is actually, uh, this might actually be changes in the plant community driving these changes in bacterial community composition. So then, finally, um, again, in a bit more detail um, in the bacterial communities. So this um, is showing you um, a co-occurrence network of the bacterial communities in the control treatment and in the drought treatment one week after ending the drought. And so these, uh, when these dots, these uh, OTUs or taxa, are connected by a line, that means that they are positively correlated um, and so what you can see here really, really clearly is that the drought network is really, really very low uh, in um, the number of nodes, the number of OTUs that are correlated with each other, um, and also that it's really far less connected. So a really strong effect of drought, mostly by reducing um, the connections and also the taxa present uh, one week after ending the drought. Uh, and so you can also see that this, the size of the sort of the most largest connectant component is really strongly different between the control and the drought network, with the drought network really being much, much smaller. However, two months after the drought, this is completely different. So at the left, again, you can see the control network and at the right, the drought network. And what you can see here is that the drought network, all of a sudden, is really, really, really strongly connected. So you can see that the number of nodes doesn't actually differ that much, but the number of connections is really much, much higher in this drought network. And this is interesting. Uh, you probably, you've probably been wondering what these um, sort of colored dots were. Well, those are those indicator taxa that I was talking about earlier. So what you can see here is that these indicator taxa are really very, very central and very connected, uh, implying that they might be driving changes in other taxa too. And you might think that a connected network is a good thing. However, very strongly connected networks actually are less stable to perturbations than uh, less connected ones. And um, I think you probably must all be wondering what it means for functioning. Um, so this is showing a structural equation model, um, again, one week after ending the drought. So what you can see here is that, um, well, plant community affects photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis very strongly affects uh, CO2 production. Um, soil moisture still very strongly affects bacterial community composition. And interestingly, bacterial community composition affects CO2 production and nitrous oxide production um, very strongly. So this is one week after ending the drought. Um, however, two months after ending the drought, there are no links anymore between uh, bacterial community. Com oh, did I go back? Between bacterial community composition and nitrous oxide and CO2 production. However, you can see here that plant community starts to affect both uh, fungal community composition and bacterial community composition. So. Um, this really implies that plant community changes are driving these changes in microbial communities. However, two months after ending the drought, this does not have uh, consequences for the functioning anymore. So just to summarize, um, plant communities dominated by the slow growing grass and Voxanthum odoratum were more resistant to drought, um, and drought increased the dominance of the fast growing grass Dactylus glomerata, and this shift in turn resulted in persistent changes 
uh, in bacterial communities that were affecting uh, functioning um, during recovery but not after recovery and it might actually have implications to the response of the system to a second drought. And um, obviously this was not just me doing all these measurements. So here you can see some people who helped um, collect all the data and write up the results. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. We've got time for just uh, one question, I'm afraid, but uh, we'd like to ask that one question. <laughs> so, were you surprised on the, that the fast grass was the one uh, which, which responded more to the drought? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it, that was unexpected, but actually that's something that um, field studies are showing too, because so, they sort of um, can capitalize on the flush of nitrogen that becomes available. Yeah. Well, it is lunchtime, uh, so it just leaves me to thank all the speakers. It was an incredibly varied uh, uh, session.